So welcome to the show today. Today I have Dave Bruno with me and Dave is known in the community in Switzerland as Super Dave. And uh, he's behind the innovation lab at UBS. He's been one of those disruptors in this uh, space for quite a while. I'm very excited to talk to you and dive a little bit more into you know, your, your story and, and where, things, where you see uh, things going in terms of you know, entrepreneurship, fintech, and especially in the context of Switzerland. So let's start with the story. Who's Dave? And uh, what's the story that got you to where we are today? Well, the funny part about it, and thanks for the people who will be listening to this, is Super Dave came from one of my friends down in Geneva, Chris McSorley, who has been the coach, manager, and owner of Geneva Servette for years. And I used to be an athlete back before I was a dad, and I spent a lot of time in the mountains and skiing. And Super Dave kind of came from that. Every time Chris saw me, he'd say, hey, Super Dave, making fun of me. And he couldn't believe that I was still alive every time that he saw me. So that kind of risk added appetite that I had back in the days when I was a consultant at PwC translated straight through in my banking career, um, which started in sort of 2000, early 2000s. Um, and I worked at Credit Suisse and then at UBS in all kinds of functions, operational accounting and finance, restructuring systems, automating them offshoring things, weaponizing, so, so to speak, systems. And I got all kinds of uh, ideas and energy off of the young teams that I was working with. Very, very cool. Now, there's been a bit of uh, talk about you in the, in the Swiss community, you know, in media and everything, about your time, about, specifically about your time at UBS uh, before you, know, you moved into what you're doing now. So tell me a bit more about that journey with UBS. Yeah, I mean, it was fantastic. I still think UBS is the best bank in the universe. Um, they do a really good job because they have some of the best people, the smartest people I've ever met. So very much my journey was almost emblematic of everyone's journey there, recovering from the financial crisis, getting back up from our knees and onto our feet and running in the market again at full speed. And part of that, I was you know, very fortunate and lucky to get a job with the head of the wealth management business globally and he and his team empowered me to do strategic things. And one of them was innovation and digital strategy. And we really kicked that off. And I met, you know, the best, top, brightest, not only bankers, but all the people around bankers. There's quite a community, as you'll know. Um, there's social entrepreneurship, impact investing. There's many innovators. There's many very wealthy clients who run 20, 40 businesses. And that level of talent just infused me with energy. I love, love, love that. I want to dive a bit more into that because when I hear innovation and UBS or innovation and, and big banks, I don't even know what to think about. So what is it? What is it? What is an innovation lab at a bank like UBS? How does it look like and, and, and what's sort of like behind and what's, what's, what's the whole goal of the whole, you know, the whole thing there? Well, it meant something different probably in 2012, 13, 14 as we got running with it. Than it does today. Innovation kind of got a bad name in the meantime. It, the I word became a bad word, as did digital strategy and big data. The buzzwords change over time, but what we were really trying to do was not just incremental improvements to the business doing IT projects. We were very much not IT. All my guys were from the business, and I had a couple of developers working with us who understood the business. Um, but, you know, very small team trying to change culture and trying to try out new things that are more into the revolutionary, so making, creating new markets for the financial industry, and then almost into the disruptive, um, which is a big word for you have no clue. You're just really trying to invent new value propositions for customers. I love that. I love your humble take on all of this. Um, you know, that also stuck out when we talked the first time very, very much. And uh, tell me a bit more about, you know, this thing innovation back when you were at UBS because these words you know when, when we talk about innovation there's always um, this this sense from you know the past it used to be IT it used to be technology right and if we launch a new system then that's innovation if we launch a new digital product that's innovation right um, but I mean there's a couple of words that you just mentioned that more and more people now talk about culture is one thing you know, there's this thing like innovation from the inside out, innovating with entrepreneurs, this whole thing about culture, about talent, about these kinds of areas that has very little to do with technology. So, I mean, where do you see those parts working together or distinct from each other? 
Well, I could just say it from my journey, which was being a facilitator, a translator between the two. So we had tens of thousands of IT people doing an annual cycle release, right? Whereas you have Spotify or other more nimble services, which release every week or every month or sometimes every day in a very early stage startup. The people who work at banks in information technology are very much aware of that. They know artificial intelligence, data analytics, um, you know, different programming, front end stuff for, um, you know, the new world. And yet they're kind of trapped in working in the old world on an annual release. And I was trying to make things faster, not just agile from an IT perspective, but let us create new business models. So it's kind of like I'm an ex-hockey player. So when you're playing hockey, you really want to get the best guy in front of the net and then get the other guys cleared off of him and just get a couple of centimeters of space around him so he can take a shot. That's all you're trying to do. And so in the hockey game, I was one of the smaller guys, but one of the more muscular guys. And I was bashing other guys out of the way so our best shooters could score goals. And my career is very much like that. Innovation is very much like that. Create some space so the real talent can shoot goals. I love, I love this. I love its philosophy, but I love this way of looking at innovation very, very much. Now, you know, innovating at a, at a large organization, not just banks, but any kind of large organization, uh, is not the easiest, easiest challenge in the world um, because there's lots of, well, it's a dinosaur, it's a tanker, right? Um, in, in, in one sense or another, and, and, and you know, changing the direction of such a large ship is not easy. So if you had to point out a couple of lessons that you learned along the way of you know, building up the innovation map at UBS and, and, and being that you know, face of innovation for quite a while uh, at UBS, what would you say, what were some of the key lessons you learned? Well, I mean, over time, you really learn to work with a lot more diverse sets of people. So at first we had a very set kind of structured agenda. We'll create a pipeline and create entrepreneurship and that should be enough. And we learned along the way that it wasn't enough, that we needed to take outside talent as well. So if we had a hypothesis around something that might be a new business model, we really had to test it over multiple phases and that meant bringing in all kinds of things, psychologists and anthropologists and people who spoke and thought, talked differently than we did. And the power of working at a big institution is when you pick up the phone and make a call to say, we're working on virtual reality or we're working on AI on a project, you get the calls back from the best people in the industries. And so that was, you know, it's really a, a very um, grateful position to be in in such an organization. So we just tried to make that change start to happen. I love that. So one, one of them is that, you know, not just looking inside of an organization, but also looking at collaborative ways of, of working with people outside, you know, uh, I mean, sometimes that can be scary, right? Because it's like, oh, you know, this is, this is here's the boundaries, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a very set construct and here's the boundaries. And like, how do we look outside, go outside and make sure that, you know, Nobody steals and things like that. It's a bit, you know, the, the, the limitation mindset, but it's not uncommon that this comes up. How did you deal with, with you know, with regulations and, 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 and all this, you know, all, this, all these things in the financial world? Well, you definitely can't break regulations. That's a, that's a golden rule within banking. So if you want to try new things, you have to do it in a separate almost entity. So you have to try something where you can't hurt anything, which means... Try things either with your own employees or try things with non-clients, just in a social environment, and do your testing very quickly in an informal way so you don't break any policies or regulations. I can tell you a little anecdote. The first three or four times I met with startup guys outside the bank, you know, startup guys are very clear. I'm not coming to your bank. I'll meet with you over here. I'm kind of on the run today. And if some of these talents came through, I'd say, hey, can we just meet up quick? And the first couple of times I felt like a criminal, you know, leaving the banking environment you know, taking off the tie and meeting with these guys for coffee, buying them a coffee. And I felt like, God, am I bribing a startup? Like, you know, because we're so used to tight regulation on everything. Um, but over time, I just got used to it and we loosened way up. This is so good. <laughs> am I bribing the startup for coffee? I love that. Yeah. <laughs> this is great. So um, is there any other like key lesson that you feel you learned in that environment of innovating at a, at a, at a large bank? Yeah, the, the other thing was definitely in the, in the last two years, especially before you start anything, you have to use that horrible word alignment. We would literally, you have to grease the tracks before you launch the ship. You know what I mean? 
And so if we're going to do something out in Asia, we would fly out, you know, the preteen and start working with people, try to identify who are the 10 guys who are really going to matter. It's the guy in compliance, risk, legal, the head of the market, the head of products and services. And then we would meet with them and their teams and kind of tell them what our ideas were and take their feedback very early. And we would usually get back really good stuff. They would never say no. They would kind of say, hey, make sure you talk to this other guy. Or, you know what? We tried something like that three years ago and it didn't work. Try this other thing. If you go out and you talk with the people, what they give you back is a ton of ideas. And by the time they see the actual thing that you're pitching in a couple of weeks or months time, they say to themselves, hey, that's mine. That's for me. You want everybody to own it and feel like that was their idea. Give them all credit for the idea as you launch it. Because in that way, you really don't offend people unnecessarily. And you get all the compliance risk legal guys who you really need in the boat to be in the boat. When it comes time and the bullets start flying, you need these guys to stick up for you. This is so funny, you know, when you, when you share that with me, because it's, it's, it's one of these things that we always, we know, right? We know, especially in startup environments with the MVPs and everything, make sure your first clients have ownership and everything. And it's, you know, and the whole, we know, we know it all, but then every day we forget it. And I'm one of those, you know, I know it today, tomorrow I, I forgot it because I do something and I don't remember this. So I go about it in the wrong way. So just this as just a, a constant reminder is so key and not just in an MVP environment in startup, but in a corporate environment, in any type of environment, this is so key, getting people to, you know, to own ideas, to own things, because then you're, you don't have to manage them, but you can simply support them in making whatever you want to make come true, come true. So I love, love, love that. Now maybe yeah. let's switch a little bit into, uh, into the present. What's most exciting right now for you? Well, I used all of that energy and what I built up as knowledge, you know, gratefully from the people who were around me, I had an awesome, amazing team and set of people. After that, um, you know, I really said, what do I want to build? You know, inspired by Elon Musk, like we talked once with his, you know, rocket launches. Um, when I look at the Falcon Heavy that launched off last night, I say to myself, God, that's what I wanted to be as a kid. And right now I'm trying to build companies and create jobs. That's it. You know, I work in Switzerland, which is kind of the old economy to some extent. So we've got quite a lot of the industry tied up in older things like financial services and there's quite a lot of jobs riding on it and so you know i love living here and i want to make sure that we have a viable future so i'm creating jobs working on building companies and startups i love that which kind of like go gets me to you know the bigger picture the bigger why uh, the driving force behind it you mentioned build companies and create jobs so tell me a bit more about that like why why do you believe that is is essential for you know, for, for our economy also, you know, in the, in the future, especially when everybody will be working sort of like remotely everywhere in their micro businesses, collaborating cross border and the whole shebang. Yeah. I think there's this mix, right? Like in the legacy industries that are here, they provide most of the jobs, but I think the statistic is something like 60% of new jobs come from small to medium sized enterprises or startups themselves. So you're kind of on the bleeding edge when you're working with smaller companies and trying to grow them because you're creating the jobs of the future. And so, for example, I'm working in artificial intelligence. There's a lot of buzz around whether artificial intelligence takes out jobs. What I see is that it's a big enhancement and enricher. So instead of sitting on a call center, talking with somebody about blocking their credit card, you're actually advising them about financials or transactions. And so I see that you know, technology has never really been a blocker of people's jobs. It usually makes life better. Yeah, and it's an interesting lesson. I mean, in general, I have this conversation almost every week, you know, about AI and jobs. And everybody shares the same objective. Everybody who's actually in the, in the area understands that it's, you know, not a, not, a, not a destroyer, but it's a creator, even if, you know, the value of destruction needs to be crossed in order for something to be created, which is always normal, right? Uh, in nature, it's normal. Like, why, you know, why is it not normal in anything else? You know, everything at the end of the day is nature. Uh, so I love, I, I, I love that. You know, one, one conversation I always really enjoy having is about failures as well. What would Thank you me. consider as one of your biggest failures? Wow, I've had so many times where I've fallen flat on my face. It's hard to identify one. But I can tell you, um, I was thinking of this one just recently, um, and I, I don't know why, but I was doing canyoning back to my sport days, and I take a lot from my sport into the corporate world when I talk with people. And I remember hanging off the side of this cliff, basically under a waterfall in France. And, you know, I was 
failing completely. I was probably going to die if I didn't sort out the situation. I had overextended my ropes. They were kind of twisted up and wrapped up and I couldn't get my ropes free. And I didn't have enough rope to get down. I was probably 200 meters from, you know, where I needed to go. And, you know, I thought and thought and thought and hung there for a long time and thought to myself, you know, today is a good day to die, but this isn't my day. And after a while of thinking about it and really just breathing and relaxing, I came up with this new way of approaching the problem I hadn't thought about. So I kind of rigged the pulley with some extra gear I had, and I, I figured it out, and I survived, obviously, because I'm here. And, you know, it was nothing smart. It was just relaxing a little bit and saying, can I look at this from a totally different way? And I think when you ask about innovation, that's a lot of where that comes from, is just how can we do this completely differently? From a fresh sheet of paper, how would it look like? Yeah, the fresh sheet of paper is big, you know, and, and just this taking, I mean, I know it's been said so many times, but taking this one step back and just breathing and saying, you know, it's maybe not as bad as it looks like, you know, um, and, you know, there's, 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 always a, there's always a way out and there's always a way to get things, um, you know, done or to get things, uh, you know, created or built. Um, but very, very often, it's not the one way we think of the first time we think about it. Very, very often, it's maybe the 751st. Um, and that comes up when we actually don't think about it. But, you know, we're in, we're in the shower or we take a walk or we have a conversation about something completely different with an employee or something like that. Yeah. And uh, I, I find that very inspiring, you know, just this view from also, you know, uh, you know, from corporate leaders as well to understand, okay, well, it's not, it's not just in the startup world, you know, that, that this thinking is present, but the mindset is present everywhere because we're all human. And we all understand that it takes a step back and takes a, you know, a breath or two to, um, to, to, to start from a blank sheet of paper. I love that. I think it helps the young people a lot. And quite a lot of what I'm doing now, so building companies in the present, is just supporting other people. I'm not the CEO of the companies, of any of them. What I'm doing is supporting the younger guys in the team. So there could be a mix of ages and skills to really believe in themselves and to change the product enough so that customers accept it or to get that next sale to really stay on the lead that they have or to back off the lead. This one isn't going to work out. So it's just kind of the finer tips. And what I find is as a Gen X guy who's kind of wishing that I was a millennial or acting like a millennial a lot of times is that that's our role now as being the more distinguished person in the room or the more senior person in the room is just to help out the younger guys and make them see the different possibles. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one thing you mentioned just right now is about this generational thing, you know, generations coming together. And for me, a generation is also, you know, uh, startups and corporates, you know, at the end of the day, it's nothing but generations in, in not, just, not in a human life cycle, but in a business life cycle, right? It's nothing, it's, it's all the same. So those, those coming together and supporting each other, because here's the funny thing, right? And you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes we go out there and mentor the, the young guys and then suddenly we're being mentored and we don't even realize it. And now suddenly it's a peer-to-peer -peer setting. And I think that's where the magic really happens. So I love- It's actually unfair. I think that I learned a lot more from my younger guys in the team than they ever learned from me. What I did was I cleared out you know, defensemen in front of the net let them shoot on goal. And for that, they're forever grateful and they'll stay loyal forever. But the things that they taught me, I mean, three years ago, I didn't have an iPhone. I was still using a corporate Blackberry. I didn't know how to tweet. I had never produced a LinkedIn post or article. I didn't have a profile online, in fact. That's all for my younger guys on the team who said, hey, come on, try this, try this, try this. Look what we do. And looking over their shoulder, that's how you learn. It's how you learn. And it's also, you know, when it comes to innovation, it's just using that buzzword, but when it comes to innovation, it's also uh, not just important to do innovation, but to live innovation and to, you know, accept, okay, you know, let's just give it a try. Let's just see what happens and not being rigid in terms of, um, you know, how we, how we act versus what we create, so to say, because it's, it's gotta be an alignment, you know, this, it's, there's gotta be that alignment there because otherwise um, it's, 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 it doesn't really work. We got to live, you know, it's, it's like walking the walk, right? Um, we we got to live what we preach as well. I find that really, really important there. Now yeah. I know you're, you're involved in quite a few things um, today. If you had to point out one or two things that really excite you the most, what would they be? Uh, can I use a company name? Sure. Whatever you want. <laughs> I mean, I'm working right now with Enviso out of Luzon. They're a spinoff of EPFL, which is, one of the top five technical universities in the world, along with MIT. And 
you know, the biometric stuff. So back to AI and seeing how that impacts things in the finance industry, for example, you know, figuring out the behavioral profile of someone versus just their static question and answer around money. When we ask people about money, we really don't understand what they might do in a behavioral context. It's only from seeing how they react to things that you can understand them as a person and therefore judge how they might react. And so, you know, using AI for that context is exciting me. I'm working to some extent in renewable energy because I really believe in it. You know, I mentioned Elon Musk every five minutes so far because he's pushing out the boundaries with electric and then autonomous vehicles. And that's so important to me, you know, to have a sustainable planet in the future. So those things and plus in fin so-called fintech, you know, changing the banking industry and making things easier for consumers is still my, still my center spot. Now, one thing you mentioned before is that you're not involved as a CEO in those, in those, in those companies. So you kind of like created a, a role for yourself that really fits your personality, your, your own style. And I guess that what, it's not very different than what you did at the Innovation Lab, because it, usually we run through life with that one key, uh, you know, essential role in everything we do, even if it's titled differently. But uh, yeah. if you had to give yourself a title, you know, besides Super Dave, but if you had to give yourself a title in, in terms of how you're involved in organizations and how you support them, what's, what, what comes up? Two, three words. I hope that they always say, he's the guy who always helps. You know, um, I have this, this uh, saying that I use, give to get. And I did a few episodes or pieces on it. Um, the more you give to people for free, not asking for anything in return, the more you get back. And I've probably over the past five years given a lot more than I'll ever get back, hopefully. And that's how you do business these days. It's not about that hardcore, you know, I give you something, you give me something back or you promise. It's more like I work with people and I try to help them out. And then I have my choice of great work. Right now I'm in a very fortunate position. I can choose what I want to do. And that's, that's always a good position to be in, a position of strength. Absolutely. It's a very interesting philosophy of life. And I very much agree with that. And I've experienced the beauty of it myself over the past couple of years. And it's uh, at the end of the day, it's nothing but a mind shift change if that's not in place already. Um, and then, you know, so to say the magic uh, very well works. Um, so this is a great one. Now let's talk a little bit more about the future. We talked about Switzerland um, as an ecosystem, Switzerland as an, as an economy. We talked about innovation in Switzerland, entrepreneurship in Switzerland. Where, so here's the thing. Switzerland has been crowned as the most innovative country in the world seven times in a row. Yeah. And it's always in the top five or three when it comes to, you know, entrepreneurship or basically anything that's, that's hot right now, right? Uh, AI, robotic. So when I look at Switzerland from the outside and I compare it with Lisbon, maybe with Silicon Valley, not from the structure and how it's organized, but from a branding perspective in terms of a perception, how it's looked at on a global level, because that has a huge influence of if I'm actually going to go to Switzerland for something or not, right? Or if I'm leaving Switzerland for something or not. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't really have that perception globally, maybe in the rankings and everything. But for example, if I do my taxes at the end of the year, or if I'm moving from one canton to another, oh my God, there is no innovation. There has just been like a hundred years of, of standstill. So do you think it's just the, the gap between business to business and, and, and the consumer level? Or where do you see where we're at right now and where we need to go? Hang on, our connection is breaking up a little. Could you ask? Yeah. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, it's yeah. coming in and out. Okay, strange. Let me see. Could you ask the last question again? I missed the last. Sure, sure, sure. Oh. No problem. You can hear me now? It's better? Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect, perfect. So I'm curious to hear your perspective, like where do you feel Switzerland needs to be or is right now or needs to be? What, what does Switzerland needs to become in terms of entrepreneurship and innovation on a global level? Because we've been crowned so many great things, but there's a big gap yeah. between real innovation and perceived innovation. Yeah, the way it feels on the ground is, is different living here. It doesn't feel very innovative when you go out to Asia for, for a few weeks and you see how digital everything is and how tuned in people are. In fact, they never look up from their phones anymore and you feel like, wow, that's the future. But actually, the future may be right here. Uh, one of my friends and former colleagues is the CTO of uh, three different companies right now. One of them is ProCivis with Daniel Gosteig of 
and Schaffhausen will be voting online from home. To me, that's democratic reform. So we're in one of the strongest, if not the strongest democracy in the world. And I think Switzerland's role of bringing digital and particular blockchain technology out to the world so that more people can vote from home when they're busy at work and be authenticated as that's really this person instead of showing your passport in a line, having to leave work to go to the newest referendum or poll. It's very uncomfortable as a user experience and therefore bad things can happen in elections like you can empty out nursing homes and you can influence people to make a vote they wouldn't necessarily have done. And so using blockchain technology for voting is one example where Switzerland should be leading. So we may not be the first cashless society or the first autoless society, but it's usually the small niche high-end stuff where Switzerland's leading on innovation, which I think is great. Now, this is so interesting because I had just had this conversation last week at the Global Entrepreneurship Network event that we hosted. And it was exactly about the comparison of Switzerland with Silicon Valley and basically all the other hubs. And, and this idea that, well, a comparison doesn't make any sense because every culture is, di is different and Silicon Valley has its things and Switzerland has its things. And what mm -hmm. you just mentioned is high-end niche technology or high-end niches that Switzerland has been really good at and probably should stay on as well. I mean, what's your perspective on that? Well, I'm um, working with F10, which is a fintech accelerator in Zurich, and we just did our vetting of startups, and three of the startups that came out were from Silicon Valley. And you might ask yourself, why would Silicon Valley startups come out to Switzerland to do innovation? And the reason is because the Valley is about hardware, and it's about huge scale, and it makes excellent hungry entrepreneurs of Chinese descent, of Arabic descent from all around the world. But what it doesn't do well is give them the right chance or the right underlying technology or teams to work in. And they found it better to be in Switzerland to launch these ideas. So, you know, working with three different Silicon Valley teams in Zurich where they found it much better and they were hoping to get in the program, that's just like an eye opener for me. Like we're doing something right. I love that. I also love shining a light on, on what's working and, uh, and, and really making sure that we as Switzerland, and I say we because I'm Swiss, uh, we as Switzerland understand who we are as a culture and not saying, well, we need to become like this, like that, because we are who we are and we need to be able to work with that in the innovation and entrepreneurship context. So this is such a brilliant, uh, you know, golden nugget there. Really appreciate it. So um, is there any, um, any last, um, you know, maybe words of wisdom that you want to pass on to um, to the next generation of entrepreneurs or corporate leaders that are innovating in their space that you say, well, if, if, if these will be the last words that I would say um, about this topic, these will be it. If there was three words I could scream at any corporate leaders in Switzerland or the U.S. or anywhere, it's trust your people. You don't need McKinsey and Booz and BCG and every other consulting shop to tell you what to do. Your people know what to do. Trust them. Give them mandates. Make your best talents into the new business guys, not the old business guys. Make them launch new things and keep your business model active. Trust your people. This is big. Trust your people. Thank you so much, Dave. I really appreciate hey, you welcome. being on the show. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm grateful to be on. Thank you, Daniel. You're doing a great job.